Okay, so now, now it should start. Okay, so why this session? Um, uh, when, when we prepared the session, we thought, okay, we want to discuss with you, um, trade unionists, with researchers from the formal and informal sector about the possibilities of trade union work, international trade union work, which fosters self-organization of workers and which includes an understanding that the trade union movement or being part of the trade union movement um, does not only mean to fight for better working conditions, but to be also part of a broader movement that aims for the transformation of society. Um, so we wanted to discuss with activists, researchers, unionists alike, perspectives of their trade union work that tries to link both the concrete struggles with struggles for a transformation of uh, society to, to overcome capitalism, patriarchy, and racism. And we felt that in order to have that discussion, um, we need to share experiences from both research and from the trade union practice um, where workers, activists build solidarity um, along borders or cross borders and between companies, between countries, um, because from our understanding, it is these movements that are able to transform societies. And therefore we wanted to take a look at different experiences from different sectors to actually engage in such a discussion. Um, so that is the, the general outline of today's debate. Um, and we want to, to have that debate um, given the four, four presentations that you had the chance to watch before. And we want to engage in a more detailed discussion with our speakers about their experiences, about their work. Um, and of course, want to give you the possibility to, to join that discussion, to share your experiences and your understandings of um, trade union work, of activist work and research that contributes to changing the society. Um, now I would give Tatjana and Janina the chance to introduce themselves and the speakers. And then I would continue with like brief um, housekeeping issues about how we want to have the discussion. I'm Tatjana, <laughs> nice to meet you all. Happy to be here, happy to have organized the session. I'm a, a researcher currently in Berlin uh, working on yeah, um, labor issues in value chains and the platform economy. I've um, had the luck to um, yeah, work with Thai for some years now. Yeah, hello from my side as well. I'm Janina. I'm also working with the Thai network in Germany for a couple of years. Um, I also do a lot of work on health and digitalization at the moment, which is also big uh, topics in the whole network globally. And beside that, I work at the University of Applied Sciences in Frankfurt as a gender advisor. So now I'm very happy to introduce our four panelists um, that uh, yeah, bring in very interesting uh, topics for our question. So we first have uh, Cynthia Machado. Uh, she's a PhD student at the moment at the Research Institute on Migration and Intercultural Studies in Osnabrück in Germany. Um, she comes from Brazil. She was uh, a teacher there before and studied history and law and did research during her master's in Kassel at the Global Labour University on domestic workers. And we're very happy to hear more about this topic um, in a little bit. So um, further, we have Mara Lira, who is um, working with a Thai Global in Brazil. She uh, is uh, active there in coordinating two networks with trade unions, different trade unions and networks in Brazil. The one is the Orange Juice Network and the second one is the Vida Viva Network that is uh, focusing on um, health issues in different sectors. Welcome, Mara. Then third, we have uh, Hendrik Simon. He's a lecturer at Goethe University uh, in Frankfurt in Germany and the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt. 
And furthermore, he's a freelance researcher at the IG Metall headquarter, so like the big uh, metal union in Germany. And he will also present on a topic of an international network within the uh, metal union. Welcome to you as well. And uh, last but not least, so we have um, Diti Bhattacharya. Um, she is a trade union activist and researcher from India. She has been um, organizing and working with um, uh, unions in the garment sector in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka for um, a decade and a half. And she's also the director of the Center of uh, Workers Management, a trade union resource based uh, center in Delhi. Welcome to you as well. So before we get to the interesting presentations, we have some little organizational details, which Michael will tell you about. Yes. Um, so I, I guess you, after two years of Corona, you are familiar with that, but just let me repeat it. So uh, I, I can see you have already muted your phones, uh, not phones, your Get your phones. Um, so if you want to speak, just unmute. Um, since we're not such a big group, I guess that will work. Otherwise, um, you can raise your hands uh, with the with the Zoom tool so that we know you have a question. Or alternatively, you can uh, write the question in the chat. Um, there is a possibility to turn on subtitles. Um, this closed caption uh, in Zoom. You, if you need it, you can activate it like in the menu line below. In German, it's called live transcript. I guess in English, it's called closed caption. Uh, you can activate it and you will see an English subtitle. Um, yeah, so that is the uh, organizational issues from my side. Um, and now we will start. Oh, one last thing. We plan for about one and a half hours. So for discussion. So that's uh, the time we have in mind. Okay. So, yeah, and before we start with the content, I will also give you a brief overview of how we want to structure the time. So we start with um, some short statements from all our panelists. Um, we hope like some of you have already watched the video statements before the little longer um, elaborations on the topics. So we would first like to ask to sum up a little bit um, so that we don't repeat everything, but all um, get a little bit into the topics again. And then we will have um, a second round of questions. Um, then we will also ask our panelists um, if they have questions on each other. So we try to start a kind of dialogue dialogue. Um, then we will have um, a last question from our side. And then afterwards, we will also invite everybody of the participants to um, ask questions. So you can raise your hand uh, later on, or you can also already write in the chat if you already think about questions beforehand. So we will um, keep them in mind for a little bit later. So I would uh, like to um, yeah, ask you to start. Um, you can also start with a little self-presentation if you want to give some more um, context about uh, your work and your connection to the topic. And then um, I would like to ask you to present your main argument again and also um, connected with the question, what um, are the challenges for trade unions and workers in your field? So we try to stay like on the um, ground level for the first round of questions, and then we come more to the international level in the next round. So uh, we said Cynthia would start, I think, so. <laughs> yes, hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Cynthia. I'm doing my PhD here in Germany about uh, domestic workers now in Colombia. But what we are going to see is the results of my research for my master's degree that I studied domestic workers in Brazil. Um, my main point was a window of opportunity that happened in Brazil when we have like uh, uh, nationally uh, a higher demand for domestic workers. At the same time, 
you we improve the social condition that less poor women find just as uh, the domestic worker as an option of job. So at the same time that we have uh, an increase in the demand, you have a decrease in the supply of these workers, and we have a history of mobilization and trade unions inside Brazil fighting for better conditions of work. So when this window of opportunity happen, happen it, the domestic workers could improve to change the labor law in Brazil. What was this international level of this window of opportunity? The, the ILO Convention 189. So in 2011, the ILO create a convention to specify to limit some uh, minimum rights for domestic workers all over the world. And this moment was really, really important for this sector. So let's talk a little bit about the sector in Brazil, uh, mainly for women, poor, and Black. Uh, also, it's an aging profession in Brazil, so it's really undervaluated. Young people don't want to be domestic workers, so you have this really stigma about this profession. At the same time, our past of colonization and slavery um, make to have a domestic worker a status. You show that you are a good provider because you pay someone to do your cleaning work. So you have this value to have one domestic worker, but you undervalue the work. Uh, when the international, this international institute uh, uh, tool uh, happened, the Brazilian domestic workers were well prepared. So we have trade unions uh, uh, in Brazil since the 1930s. They try really hard to mobilize. They try really hard to put the labor rights for domestic workers in our labor law, but uh, they are really not well succeed back then. And even when we have like a new constitution in 1988, uh, we have like in the constitution, 37 rights for workers in general. You have one article with uh, rights for labor, but they also prevent the domestic workers. Like these rights is for everyone, but domestic workers. So from the 37 rights that all workers had before, domestic workers have like six or seven. So they have, we have like a really, a uh, long history of trade unions about domestic work in Brazil. And when the convention start to, to prepare, we were really well connected, prepared with uh, demands, specific demands to put inside the convention. Uh, it's important to state that back then we have a left-wing government. So the workers, the, the part in ILO that the workers were represented represented, they choose to send domestic workers trade unions instead of be the big uh, confederations or, or stronger trade unions, they choose to send domestic workers leaders there. And at the same time, the government choose to send people connected with the trade unions movements. For example, Benedita da Silva, she was a um, back then a federal deputy, and she was a domestic worker herself. So when Brazil was in the convention, we were really well prepared and took a, a good participation there. And what, is, what was important, internationally, the domestic workers also was trying to mobilize in an international level. We have a lot of trade unions, old trade unions, but connections between all the domestic workers in the world was really new. So when they start to be there in the, con in the convention, 
the really well prepared countries help it the not so well prepared. So the domestic workers and trade unions connect with the ones that have uh, specific proposals, have arguments, and they work kind of together in a block. So okay. my main yeah shortly um, we have one more minute for you and um, okay. I don't know if it's easier for you when you talk if we say it otherwise Michael would raise this card like one minute uh, before we ask you to uh, get to an end so that everybody can speak. <laughs> okay, just to finish, it was really this um, this participation in the convention make a really united the domestic workers, they create a, a better uh, networking. And after this convention, they create an international federation of domestic workers. And what I could see, like when you mobilize internally, you get strong to take part in an international movement. And at the same time, when you are in an international movement and you succeed there, you can use this victory to in your own country. So they in Brazil, they use this participation, they use this awareness, they use this victory to look, to say to the, the population, look, the words agree with us. The word agree that domestic workers need more rights. So now we should as Brazilians do something. If the words agree, we should do something as well. So that's why uh, my main argument is this. Your national mobilization prepares you for international mobilization and the international mobilization give you more strength to your national battlefield. So yes, that's this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hand over directly to Hendrik. Thank you so much, uh, Janina, Tatjana and Michael and my fellow members here of this session for organizing this session and of course for having me. My name is Hendrik Simon. I'm a postdoc researcher at the Peace Research Institute Frankfurt from 1st of May now. So it is a pleasure to engage with all of you today, pleasure to engage with all of you today on the question how we could um, organize and build union power along global value chains and my contribution to the session mainly deals with the organizing along the global automotive value chain and as an example I use the IG Metall International Network Initiative which I have been accompanying now scientifically for some years. But I, before I will introduce the Internationale Netzwerk Initiative, the International Network Initiative of IG Metall, um, first, I would like to ask you the question, why are automotive chains a social problem at all? And to answer this question, one has to know a bit about how these value chains developed and uh, transformed during the last 30 years. Because just 30 years ago, the entire automotive production process from development to marketing was generally organized within single companies but that has changed extremely we can say that we have seen a massive differentiation and transformation of value chains in the automotive sector on a global scale so keywords of course are the fragmentation of factories outsourcing, offshoring, the global dissolution of labor boundaries and automotive value chains, and there are thousands of suppliers. So now the question is, why is this a problem for trade unions? And I think the most important answer is that for trade unions, value chains are already a problem on the national level. That's also what we've heard in the previous two talks and the deeper you go into an automotive value chain the worse the working conditions normally become so even in germany that's the case so if conditions at an original equipment manufacturer an oem like volkswagen and wolfsburg for instance are relatively good 
not only wages, but also unionization at tier two or tier three supplies are significantly worse, even in Germany. So this global transformation of value chains further exacerbates these problems and um, restructuring value chains has of course led to increasing competition between plants, workers, and also unions in different countries. And there you could say this competition may prevent the possibility of transnational solidarity. So it is widely recognized that trade unions face major challenges in developing effective responses to the globalization of production processes. And this is of course due to a fundamental incongruity. So while companies are globally positioned and now dominate 80% of world trade, trade unions, transnational strategies have so far been largely confined to the national framework. Nevertheless, and we've already heard this in the previous two talks, there are also positive examples of organizing along global value chains from below. And this is also where my case comes into play. I think it's an interesting example in the automotive value chain sector, it's uh, the IG Metall Internationale Netzwerk Initiative, the International Network Initiative. And this International Network Initiative also points in a sense to a strategic reorientation of IG Metall's transnational trade union work. So the Network Initiative aims to achieve more intensive and lasting transnational cooperation between workers representatives in an international company. Um, for more details, you can also watch um, my interview with Jochen Schroth and Katrin Schäfers, uh, which I prepared for this conference. Um, but just to sum it up, what is interesting about this international network initiative? From my perspective, it's this special feature um, or the, the special feature is the focus on the plant to plant level in one global company. So the basic idea here in keeping with the name of the initiative is the transnational networking of workers, representatives such as works councils or trade unionists. So in other words, the focus is not so much on union officials, but on the workers in the plants themselves. They are connected with each other in order to jointly develop countervailing power against corporate strategies and to build trust and solidarity among themselves. They can exchange information about company plans and strategies organize themselves in bodies such as the European Works Council or exchange ideas on topics such as the transformation of work, digitization, outsourcing, offshoring, and so on. So to conclude, at the moment, the Network Initiative has several projects and companies in Germany and abroad, currently, for example, in Mexico and South Africa. And yeah, I look forward to discuss the details with you now. So thank you very much. Thank you for your introduction, Hendrik. And then I will hand over to Ditti. Thank you, Janina. And thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting conference. Um, well, mine is to do with the garment supply chain uh, and this is more to do with the garment supply chain uh, challenges that we face uh, in organizing and even uh, negotiating in the garment supply chain. I've worked in this sector for over now 10 years uh, plus, and uh, our experience is that um, 
this sector, unlike the other sectors that we're talking about, is um, plagued with too many Northern actors uh, who are intervening in uh, how this sector should be organized, how, how uh, working conditions in this sector should be determined, what is good for this sector, what is not good for this sector. There are too many players in this field. And uh, that's exactly what I would like to uh, talk about in brief here. And um, which is basically, if you look at um, the garment supply chain, it's a sector which has been largely non-unionized. In South Asia, if you're looking at just South Asia, um, these were all um, first generation workers coming into work in factories for the first time. They were women workers, they were largely from agricultural backgrounds, so they had no clue what a union looks like, what a union is, and therefore it was uh, easy to um, create a whole industrial workforce which was um, devoid of unionization. So uh, when this was the case, uh, what, what we could see was in various places, especially in Bangladesh, there were um, some spontaneous protests which kind of broke out when um, there were massive accidents or people were not able to survive with the kind of low wages that existed in that um, sector. So there was spontaneity in the protests that existed but there was nothing which was uh, sustainable organizing that could happen. Even today, the, if we look at the large number of unions in Bangladesh, or um, especially in Bangladesh, there are a large number of garment workers unions, where you would see it's only 5% of the workers of the total workforce, which is unionized actually. And in the case of India and Sri Lanka, the number of unions are also less. So uh, even though we have a huge workforce, uh, the, ga the garment workforce in India is almost three times that of Bangladesh, but the unions are, you can count it in your fingers. So um, in that sense, this was a sector where people thought that others need to get involved to change the working conditions. There were sweatshop conditions and the global north from where the work was getting offshored with the restructuring of the supply chain, uh, they realized that they needed to raise the question of sweatshop conditions in the global south. And initially, actually, there were two uh, dimensions to it. One was that when you're offshoring, you're saying, oh, those are bad jobs, don't take away our jobs from the north because our jobs in the north are better and the, um, and the and capital is shifting to low cost, low wage um, centers. So don't take away our jobs. So it started with that, but then eventually when most of the jobs shifted to the global south, it was like, okay, we need to, we are responsible for the bad working conditions in the global south, so we need to intervene. So several kinds of players came into the picture. And if we want to broadly divide these uh, players, we can see that there are three kinds of players. One are, of course, the NGOs. And by NGOs, I mean funded organizations. Uh, it can even be corporate funding. It can be just uh, funding from other sources. Um, so that's one funded organization kind of um, category. The other is the MSIs. So these are multi-stakeholder initiatives that were set up in, um, in more in the 2000s than earlier. And these were um, set up by the companies along with bringing in other players like uh, campaign organizations, like social organizations of the Global South, workers' organizations, it may be trade unions, it may be support organizations, which all became part of these multi-stakeholder initiatives. And these multi-stakeholder initiatives were about resolving disputes in the supply chain. So you could take a complaint that you have against a certain uh, company, 
into these multi-stakeholder initiatives and you could resolve a uh, problem within these initiatives. So that's the second category. But the third category is actually the most problematic category. It's the global unions themselves, the global unions and the Northern unions themselves. So when it comes to, uh, so this is where the problem lies, that when we talk about solidarity between the North and the South, if, uh, if it is the Northern uh, unions and the global unions, which are actually actively involved in the interventions in the global South with the trade unions, the expectation is that it would be a relationship of equality. But what we see is, uh, what we see is that most of these relationships kind of uh, reflects the, the power imbalance that exists between the countries from where these uh, Northern actors come from and the, their partner organizations and the partner countries where you work in. So if there is a imbalance between the North and the South, it is reflected even within the solidarity and support functions that happen within these uh, involvement. I would end here and I guess we will get opportunity to talk about it as we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for your first statement, Ditti. So I give over to Michael and we will go more in depth, of course, now. So um, the next question for all of you, I mean, you spoke about um, challenges that workers in your um, presentations on your example face. And um, can you explain to us how do unions or workers organization respond to their challenges and how they organize um, workers at the local level? And again, my, the first question would go to Cynthia or the questions would go to Cynthia first. And now it's uh, four minutes for everyone. So after three minutes, I will show the card. Uh, okay. And um, so as trade unions, the problem with, uh, to try to organize domestic workers are they are isolated. So you have normally you have one or two domestic workers per house. So have contact with them is hard because you cannot go to someone else's house and demand to speak with the domestic worker there. You have also the problem of the informality. Normally the majority are informal. They don't have any formal contract. So they, they, they stay in a really precarious situation because they are afraid to be fired if the uh, employer knows that they are talking about it. We have problems also in the other side because you also do, do not have a big company. You have small individuals that are the employers. So the main problems with the mobil mobilization is this, where to find them how to talk with them in, and how to discuss with the employers. So it, this is really complicated. What I realized is they, they try in uh, really one by one to talk with each domestic workers. They try to make events that invite them to go to this place in outside work hours. And they try something uh, connected with other organizations as something uh, connected with feminism or racial problems who fight uh, racism in Brazil. So they try to make these connections. Sometimes you also can see uh, using church, like a, a place that you have a lot of um, um, Catholical and evangelicals in Brazil, and they go to these places to try to talk with them. And so, yes, it's, it's complicated, but they are creating methods. Uh, I saw a small trade unions that also create apps to connect them, uh, WhatsApp groups, uh, 
parties or religious events. So they are using this and they also are working really well using the awareness in the society. This past of slavery, this past of colonization, uh, the society feel that they have, they are in depth with this group. And uh, unfortunately, we have many cases of violence, like from in the last three months, uh, were found three different women that were in, literally enslaved in the domestic work servitude. And the, the, worst, the worst case scenario, the woman was for 72 years a slave. So they, she was working as a domestic worker for 72 years. So yes, they are using this mobilization with the, the society and trying to do this small get togethers to have the, this, uh, uh, to mobilize this group. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, Hendrik, how is uh, IG Metall organizing workers in the network initiative? How is organizing of workers happening? Thanks a lot. So I would say one of the biggest uh, challenges is, of course, the lack of transparency in these value chains. So workers in different plants, even in German value chains, um, this, of course, is even more the case in the uh, international or global value chains. Another um, challenge is uh, the great power of the transnational companies and um, the lack of uh, strategies uh, on the side of the trade unions, which now hopefully chains, changes a bit. Um, but in the concrete um, uh, work of the network initiative, Sometimes, of course, it's also the uh, different degrees of um, union organization in different plants and both in Germany and in the international cooperation. Um, so this also open or oftenly depends on the position of the company in the hierarchy of the value chains and OEMs, the degrees of Union organization tends to be high in tier two or tier three suppliers, um, yeah, rather less. Um, but of course, it also depends on the national context. So in Germany, we still have rather high degrees of union organization in the automotive industry, whereas in countries like uh, Mexico or South, Afri South Africa, we may have medium union organization, but in countries like Morocco, um, only very low union organization. And this is, of course, also a problem for an uh, initiative that tries to bring uh, trade unions together on an eye to eye level. And that also brings me a bit to the comment of Titi that it's really important to ask ourselves how can we overcome these asymmetries also within the um, union corporations on a global scale. So, another challenge would be of course that corporations try to prevent the networking by trying to make transparency more difficult so um, there's one example the sub project in the international network initiative in the lear company which is also a best case practice in this project but here it was uh, here the, the project was um, able to bring in um, workers from Serbia and from South Africa to the European Works Council and the LEA management reacted by leaving the European Works Council without a report. So that was quite clear. They're not willed to let this participation of non-EU countries happen. Um, the story continues then and the workers were able to build counterpower. But um, still, we see there's not the um, support, of course, for this networking from the side of the management. And in one case, we actually also have a small anal analysis right now. Uh, Morocco, we can also say it's pretty clear it will be really hard to uh, find a cooperation here because workers here often do not even dare to 
uh, get into trade unions. We have blacklists in the automotive industry here. Uh, so if you get into the, uh, a trade union, you might get fired and won't even find another job in the industry. Um, so only very shortly, what exactly is the network initiative initiative doing they try to organize of course first of all the respective trade unions they're in a way the gatekeepers for the local plants but the idea is really to uh, connect the workers themselves on the plant to plant level and uh, this of course is also a big challenge because you need uh, intrinsic motivation you need uh, the building of trust and solidarity uh, in an interpersonal level and um, so the idea is here of the initiative to not only have the officials in the project but really the bottom-up workers in the plants yeah thank you hendrik um did you also spoke about the challenges in the garment industry for union organizing how do unions respond to that how do how do they organize workers well, um, as I said initially, that if you look at the unionization rate in the garment industry, it's very, very low. It's not even up to 10%. And uh, if you're talking about uh, the German experience that Hendrik was sharing, and uh, even the Brazilian experience of the Orange Juice Network, we're talking about a few corporations or one corporation that you're dealing with. When, but it, when it comes to the question of the garment supply chain, one factory is producing for multiple transnational corporations. So uh, it's very difficult to even um, form uh, a concrete or a sustained um, strategy within a factory. So the whole concept of uh, organizing within a factory comes under question when you have multiple people sourcing from uh, multiple co corporations sourcing from one single factory. So uh, initially what the, the strategy has been uh, in the garment industry to organize industry level units as opposed to factory level units so which was one way the idea uh, this was um a strat taken as a strategy because it was difficult to organize factory level unions given the uh, legal structure given the attack on unions given the um nature of the industry per se and of the workers itself so uh the idea was to first go for industry level um organizing but eventually what uh, we came to the understanding that factory level unions were also very necessary to actually come to concrete um, negotiations with uh, both the management at the factory level as well as those who are sourcing from these factories so uh, that was one of the things that came out of uh, i would say the network that we are a part of, which is the exchange network, which is a network between the garment, work, garment workers in South Asia, which is India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, and uh, German retail workers. And here, I think uh, I will bring up this whole question of inequality that I was raising earlier, that when we first started interacting with the German workers, they would always tell us, uh, what can we do to help you? What can we do to help? And it was very interesting that, you know, it's, uh, we're all workers and we're all workers in the same retail, uh, same uh, supply chain. And there are some workers who are really not better off in any way, uh, if we look at it in a, larger scheme of things they are suddenly think that just because they are in the global north just because they are um a white skinned they think they can help those in the global south so we actually started with that uh, discussion that it's about building equality within the um solidarity networks that we need to come up with and we need to understand each other we need to understand each other's working conditions we need to understand each other how bad badly off we are along the supply chain and there is just uh, one corporation which is responsible for our working conditions along the supply chain. So if a retail worker in H&M 
is not able to pay the rent, is not able to take care of your children. It's the same for the garment workers who are producing for H&M in Bangladesh or in India. So it's not very different. It's just that you look different, you stay in different working conditions or different countries. So your conditions are a little, looks a little better, but it's not really as, as much better as you think it is. So I think that was a very critical um, understanding. And from there, we were able to look at and focus and we were, able to get the unions to focus on transnational companies to uh, build a network that we work on focus on certain companies where uh, the German retail workers have certain kind of bargaining power, we can relate to them. So we negotiate along the supply chain on, in those companies, which is where uh, a certain uh, transnational company is sourcing from. So it may not be the single sourcing company from a certain factory, but it may be a major sourcing company. And so uh, the strategy moved from being um, industry level union organizing to focusing on factories, to focusing on factory level organizing and building plant level leadership who could then uh, bring up issues. So the example that I had done in the video statement is one such example where um, one whole factory was unionized and hence the workers could ultimately, the union could ultimately ensure the reinstatement of 1200 workers in the time of the pandemic, which was quite a big victory um, given the supply chain um, in the garment industry. Mm, thank you, Diti. Um, so the next round of questions would be that we want to um, give you the possibility like Viti and Cynthia, Mara and Hendrik to, to discuss what you found interesting um, about each other's presentations or what would you like to learn more about or what surprised you and what the others said. Um, so Diti, Cynthia, Mara, Hendrik, who would like to, to start with? a comment or what surprised you, what you would like to learn more from the others. Um, Diti, Cynthia, Hendrik, do you have anything to add? Uh, I can. So yeah. uh, yes, uh, uh, Brazilian domestic workers trade unions would be really interested. Uh, I, I'm more a, a researcher, but I believe that they are really interesting in this kind of partnership. They are really active in the Latin America network and try to be part of the international network. So yes, I think that would be really important. And for all of you, this uh, really more connect with this, this international supply chain, uh, the pandemic, the war with Ukraine, uh, we kind of start to see many countries talking about uh, you have to focus more in production in production nationally because something could happen and you are kind of um, you you can stay without your products so you have the problems with shipment uh, with China you have problems with the pandemic we have problems now with the war and Germany realizing that they are dependent in the from Russia. So how can you, how do you see this perspective for the labors? Like would be a chance to have more power nationally and by doing that uh, in strength, the internationally connections, it would be a, a good time to do something now or you don't see, really see a difference happening in the supply chain. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, mine is actually for Cynthia and I'm kind of curious in understanding how uh, she said it when she made a presentation about um, how it was easier to get the laws into place and uh, because it was a left 
government when uh, the ILO convention was brought in. India is not a signatory of the ILO convention on domestic work. And uh, we have a right-wing government just like you do right now. And we would like, I would really like to know how things have changed or if it has at all changed with your government and how do unions there respond to that? Um, Should I answer yeah, or wait please, for the audience? Please. Um, my suggestion would be let's um, that you answer and then we open um, the questions for the plenary also. Exactly. So Henrik can also join in, but it's also very convenient that we had a quite similar question on the condition of a right-wing government in Brazil in the chat already. So you're very welcome to talk about this topic, Cynthia. So to be honest, uh, since the impeachment of Dilma, the coup, the situation is really bad. So in, in this sense, it's not for domestic workers, it's, ma it's more for everyone, all workers. And looks like we are fighting every day for a different cause because it's uh, environment issues, health issues, labor law. So you're always struggling. In Brazil, the, we have one nice thing that um, the justice system tends to be more uh, prone to workers. So with the law, normally you're kind of uh, winning in the justice system, but they are really trying to change the law. So, so far, uh, the situation is really decreased, is really bad but we still have the justice system to go. But my problem is if Bolsonaro is elected or really do a coup, I don't know, after four years. So, so far, everyone's kind of more, instead of uh, increased li uh, uh, rights, we are trying to prevent to lose them. So it's a struggle every day. We lost a lot, but so far, many of the bad uh, labor law changes, we are prevent them to be a reality uh, using the judi judiciary. But I don't know for how long more. And we are trying to fight in all fields, uh, organizing mobilization, protests, um, shows, events, every place that we have a space to voice our concerns, we are using. But uh, it's really critical situation. And so far, we could manage. But I really don't know with more years of uh, extremely right wing government what would happen. Thank you very much. OK, so we go on with the last question to understand it right. So there was the question, um, how does uh, the Igmental network um, work with uh, workers in a Chinese context or with Chinese workers since there is no real independent unions there. So I guess it's also a question, do you work in this context? But maybe you can also look a bit on repressive structures again. Thank yeah, you. I think that's already the answer. <laughs> so we, that is, China's really, um, yeah, it's it's really like a tough nut and still open how to crack it. And I also recently talked to someone from industry all, and they are also pretty confused how in these times they um, will get into the field in China. And it's the same with uh, IG Metall. One could say at least in the really, um, yeah, advanced uh, project um, of the International Network Initiative where we really need strong trade unions. And if, it, if you don't have them on the counterpart, it doesn't really make sense uh, to get into contact because at least in this initiative, because you need the uh, equality of interests and this asymmetry uh, should be avoided. And that's what I really liked also in Diti's talk. And I think one last point I wanted to raise is um, also the question, where are disruptive points within the value chains? Because we heard a lot about challenges, but we could also think about, okay, uh, aren't there disruptive points in the value chains where also union organizing could help to um, really get companies under pressure and to foster um, unionizing? 
Thank you very much. So I guess we're in the end of the session. Thank you very much for all your contributions, Hendrik, Ditti, Cynthia, Mara. Thanks everybody for listening and for the questions. Um, yeah, I think we shed like interesting um, perspectives on uh, organizing in different countries and different connections. We see there's very different structures on the ground, but there's also a lot of similarities of uh, workers having um, hurdles to organize, but also try to organize on the ground together with their unions and support of the unions, but also as workers on the ground. So if you haven't watched the longer video statements yet, I put the link in the chat again, so you can um, still um, yeah, have some more information maybe. And I guess uh, there will be further possibilities of uh, discuss discussing more in depth since we saw that, uh, yeah, there's a lot of strategic questions left, I guess, or that can be elaborated even more. So thank you very much for today. Have a good morning, midday, evening, depending on where you are at the moment and um, talk to you soon.